Really excited to kind of be here, and I really like what that, I really like what you were kind of saying because uh, yes, I was the director of marketing and PR for a big West End agency. I toured lots of fantastic shows uh, around the country, but I blagged it. I had a career in marketing. I've got no experience. I've got no formal training of marketing. I've got no formal training in in, uh, in PR. I blagged it. I kind of thought, well, what what would I want to see? And just went with it for the next ten years. And didn't do so bad, to be honest with you. And I'm kind of here to say that I'm sort of still blagging it, people. And you can blag it too. Uh, all of the marketing consultants in the room that are dying to get your business are now thinking, get that man off stage immediately. Uh, marketing consultants in the room, you are really important. Not really important. That's not important. So we'll just go with it. Uh, OK, so I want to talk about marketing the unmarketable. Uh, uh, the first marketing consultant in the world was a man called Sigmund Freud, the godfather of psychotherapy. I'm a psychotherapist, I'm in the business of communications, I'm in the business of talking, and I'm in the business of listening. So as, as a psychotherapist and as the founder chief executive of Survivors Manchester of, of my organisation, I'm listening. Exactly the same thing that we should all be doing, whether we uh, are uh, qualified marketing and PR experts or whether we are just working in marketing and PR and trying to get our business and, and our messages out there. And it starts with what you look like. That's what it starts with for me. So when I am want to engage with an organisation, the first thing I do is I go online, I have a look at their website, I'll have a look at their Twitter sphere, I might have a look at their Facebook, and if they look crap, I think they're crap and I don't deal with them. It's that simple. In the same respect, when I go into a supermarket and I'm looking for a loaf of bread, uh, the nice buns that you can get, as you can see, I'm, I'm working on uh, eating lots of buns, but if one looks like someone's put the finger in it and not really sort of uh, uh, presenting it well, I'm, I'm just not going to pick that one. I'm going to pick the one that looks nice. When I first started Survivors Manchester, nobody wanted to listen to me. I was knocking on people's doors saying, Hi, do you want to come and have a conversation about sexual violence and, of, of, of young boys and men? Can you imagine how that went down? People were saying, No, 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 no. We'd, uh, we want to really support uh, uh, wounded animals. Not that wounded animals is a bad thing to support, but it kind of made me go, wow, that's, that's really interesting that we uh, were in a situation. And this was prior Rochdale and prior the, the big cases and prior Jimmy Savile. So we were in a little bit of a different world. But I did think it was really, really interesting that no one kind of wanted to listen to me. I have a kind of a little bit of a, a declaration in the fact that I'm a survivor myself and I'm really open about that and I'm absolutely fine about it and I'm not going to have a breakdown. Possibly. <laughs> but what was really, really important was there was lots of organisations that were going to the same funders, the same commissioners, the same local authority elected members, the same MPs saying, blah, blah, blah has been affected my life and I want you to give me some money. They've heard it all before. They've heard it time and time and time again. So what was my, and this is going back to Here's a bit of a marketing speak. My USP, my unique selling point. Well, my unique selling point was my story, but everyone's heard all of those before. So I just thought, why don't I just do my USP, my unique, store, my unique selling point, with a little bit of what I used to do when I was blagging people to come and buy tickets for my show that was going to Liverpool Empire when there was four or five other shows in the city, and I wanted you to spend your £35 in my venue for my show. I'll just jazz it up. I'll just do the Wizard of Oz. The little man behind the curtain that's peddling like, well, while there's these big smoke and mirror things happening and it all looks fantastic, I'll just do that. So, I went over to see, and this is where the experts do come in, they really do. I went over to see a, a designer that I worked with and said, can you make something look really nice for me? And he did. And that was the start, that's my brand. We don't like to talk about this within health and social care. We want to talk about how we can heal the world and we can do all of that Mother Teresa stuff. And that's really important, don't get me wrong. 
but it's also really important to think a little bit like a business. So, I created my brand. My brand runs through everything now. Every time we create a really important report, every time we've got something important to say, which I'm, uh, within the last uh, three minutes, I bet you've gathered that everything I say is important. Uh, so every time I'm speaking, I think it is the most important thing that anyone's ever said. Marketing people talk about don't believe your own hype. Rubbish. Believe your own hype. Because if you walk into a room and you're confident and you believe your own rubbish, everybody else believes it, trust me. I've been doing it for 20 years now and it's not failed me yet. I'm also really honest about the fact that I've been blagging it for 20 years and that's not failed me yet either. So, back in uh, 2013, the uh, Government Home Office released uh, a, a giant pot of money, £4 million for the Rate Support Fund. I got really excited and thought, right, I'll do that funding bid. And I looked through all of the uh, criteria and realised I couldn't apply for it because I worked with boys and men. And the funding criteria stated because I didn't work with girls and women, I wasn't allowed to access this fund. The message I received is boys and men don't get raped. Boys and men don't get sexually assaulted. Boys and men don't need this money because they don't need services. And I thought, bollocks. So, I started a campaign. A campaign of annoying MPs, writing to local authority members, knocking on doors, telling people that what was happening was wrong. And I did it using marketing. I decided to treat this like I treated a marketing campaign. So I got my Excel spreadsheet and I wrote down a few dates and I decided that what I would do is I'd add a couple of tasks in. The marketing campaign started to grow and I just sent out emails to anyone that I thought might listen and those that I thought wouldn't listen, I sent them four emails. And I thought, at some point, somebody will listen. I got uh, some information that one of my emails had landed on the desk of somebody at Amnesty International. <coughs> now, let me tell you something. By this point, I'm running an organisation that everybody thinks is huge. Everybody thinks we've got lots of money. I'm working 18 hours a week. Uh, I'm being paid for 18 hours a week. I'm working with uh, Tony in a different organisation for 25 hours a week and I'm doing stuff at the weekend for free. And I'm doing the Wizard of Oz thing, I'm making it look smoke and mirrors. It looks like this huge organisation with this huge amount of power and really just a little man behind a curtain peddling away. Next minute, a uh, telephone call from the Ministry of Justice. Uh, Mr Craig, could you desist with your campaign? At that point I thought, what campaign? Oh, they mean that thing that I'm doing, that emailing people. Uh, and actually what, what happened was the Ministry of Justice, the minister, the victims minister and a number of other ministers had kind of got a little bit worried. Me? This is it. This is it. Was worried about me. I thought that was really amusing and then thought, wow, what an ego boost. Now I'm already an egomaniac. I don't need anybody else filling my ego, but it grew and grew and grew. So I just carried on blagging it. What happened in the end was this. We had this amazing campaign that we worked with the Home Office and we worked with the Ministry of Justice, the Break the Silence campaign. It was involving uh, tweeting, it involved thunderclap. I learned lots of things, but again, I was blagging it. The results were amazing. 2.5 million people uh, heard our message. We worked with Hollyoaks. Hollyoaks got in touch and asked us whether we'd do something with them. We worked with them and we got some videos out there and we, we had a storyline going and all of this because a few people saw the wizard. They didn't see the little man behind the curtain peddling on this thing to make all of this smoke and mirrors happen. Uh, what we also got was two million pounds. The government, for the first time ever, eight seconds to go, uh, ring-fenced some money 
for the Male Rape Support Fund. Two million pound, first time this had ever happened. Never before has money been specifically given to male victims. That enabled, I think it was 10 organisations across the UK to apply for some money, enabling them to provide services, direct services, counselling, psychotherapy services to male victims. It enabled the minister to stand out and start talking about what they're doing and recognising that men get sexually assaulted, men get hurt. From that, the campaign has grown and grown and grown and we're still doing stuff with it now and we're still getting people talking about male victims. We're still using the smoke and mirrors. And I'm saying to you today, with no seconds to go, don't worry, don't sit there thinking that you can't market whether you've got qualifications or not, whether your product is a difficult product to market. If I can market and I can campaign and I can get people engaged in conversations about male victims of rape and sexual violence, you can do it with anything too. Thank you very much.